Good evening, brothers and sisters, comrades and friends. <laughs> brothers and sisters, still makes me laugh. Um, so today is Thursday, just a few days after I posted my previous video. Um, and the reception I got from it was, well, I, I'm surprised. The, the number of people that are commenting is still going up. <clears throat> the number of views is, is incredible. In fact, it's a far more popular video than, than many, many of the weightlifting ones that I've put up, which is fantastic. So I would like to say to everybody that watched and commented and liked, and then so many subscribers to the channel, it's fantastic. And thank you. I really, really um, appreciate that a lot. That, that's really amazing. I said if it was received well and if anybody wanted it, I would try to do other another one or another couple because there is so much to talk about just going to adjust this camera slightly there we go <laughs> um i would and so because you're all such lovely darlings i thought i would jump in and do a second one while the iron is hot and can be struck <laughs> i wanted to just address a couple of things before i got going um firstly to the guy that said, oh, here we are, another intellectual who's wearing a satanic symbol on his on his T-shirt. The T-shirt I was wearing, as uh, was pointed out, was a West Side Barber weightlifting T-shirt. Uh, West Side Barber being the American gym and was owned by Louis Simmons, who used to have the symbol for the gym being a W. Being, that being the symbol that was on my t-shirt uh, in, um, in a celebration of his life because he died not that long ago. The satanic symbol, symbol was Louis' symbol for the gym, West Side, a W. So, uh, slightly awkward for the guy that said that. Maybe you need to have a little word with yourself or <laughs> step outside of that little bubble you're in to see the sort of things that are going on in the world outside. Um, I was amazed by how many Jehovah's, oh, Jehovah's Witnesses watched that video. I would have thought, in fact, I know it to be the case, that they shouldn't be watching that sort of content. I don't care. I don't give a shit. If they want to watch that and they can reconcile that with their God-trained conscience, Bible trend, conscience, whatever they call it these days. So much has changed. So you've seen a lot. Good for you. Because if you can if you can dodge that one and your conscience is fine, why don't you just dodge a few more things and do what you want? Um something else I wanted to mention. Um I think I get the impression that a few people think that I'm newly left. Um and that isn't the case. I'm I'm 50 next month in September, and I left round about my mid about 35 I was when I left. So I've been gone a good while. Um, I didn't uh, get shunned. Nothing happened. I wasn't disfellowshipped. I just kind of slipped away and never really just. You know, no, no real attempt was made to get me back or anything like that. And um, I have I have quite a difficult personality <laughs> and I'm quite a big guy. And uh, there have been um, to the house unknowingly, unknowingly um, that I was, I'm a former Jehovah's Witness and I have made my position quite clear without saying it in so many words that they're not welcome. Um, I think big angry men um, and women, I'm sure, um, can get the message across pretty quickly that they don't want certain people in their garden, on their drive, knocking on their doors. So whilst I don't think I'm a do not call, I can still have my little bit of fun helping them understand that they're not welcome. Anyway, I'm sure that's going to annoy many Joe Well, I'm going to knock on your door. Okay, well, you can come and knock on my door if you want. You'll get short change. Anyway, what? I've made some notes here because the last time I was just rabbiting and 
I don't think it was as bad as incoherent, but there was a lot of unanswered questions, a lot of unfinished points and things that I would perhaps have liked to have talked about. Um, having watched some more videos, the experiences that other people have given far more eloquently than what I could ever have done. And so I will go through some of these points again, and hopefully this can be received in much the same way. Um, I spoke at the beginning of the last video about my memories of the last birthday presents my parents ever bought me. Uh, my dad has bought me presents subsequently because now, now I have a fantastic relationship with my dad, um, who isn't a Jehovah's Witness anymore either. My mum is, my brother and sister are not, um, but it's definitely damaged our family. But I have a very good relationship with my dad. But we are going to talk about at times when it wasn't so good. Um, not long, so for those that remember, um, I was taken to the town and bought a birthday present. That was the last birthday present I had ever as a four year old um, until recent times. I remember not long after that, I, I can't tell you with any certainty how long after that it was. It may have been days, it may have been weeks, I don't know. I was still very young. And my mum took me. I, I cannot remember if I would have asked to go with her or if she would have taken me along. I can't, I'm, I'm nearly 50. I can't remember with any degree of accuracy what it would have been like at four or five. I may have asked to go, but it's irrelevant. We, it was back when there were the three meetings a week. It was the Tuesday book study, which was actually, book study is inaccurate. It's studying the Bible with the aid of a book. When it, the two meetings on a Tuesday, the Theocratic Ministry School, and then the service meeting, and then obviously there was the Sunday public talk and the watchtower. This was the Tuesday meeting. And I remember, back then we didn't have computers and phones and all of those kinds of things that would occupy your time. And I was a typical boy that was brought up in those years. I mean, this was probably late seventies. And most of my time back there in, in the northeast of England was spent out climbing trees and fishing and catching frogs and making balls, just out all day. You're up, your breakfast, you're out. You're back for your lunch, you're out. You're back for your dinner, you're out. You're out and you're never still. I uh, went along with my mum to the Tuesday book study and we went in. Everybody was super smartly dressed. And it was all fun and it was great. And there was a guy there that was solving Rubik's cubes for people that were taking their Rubik's cubes in front of other younger people anyway. And everyone was super friendly and super nice until the guy that I at the time assumed was in charge called order or whatever it was. And everybody stopped talking and sat still for an hour. Well, this was totally alien for me. I had absolutely no experience of having to, <laughs> to sit still for an hour. I was barely capable of it. But I remember thinking, I'm not sure about this. This is a long time to be sat doing nothing, just listening to people talk about things that were incomprehensible to me. You know, praying, to close your eyes and all that sort of thing. Anyway, that was the first meeting I went to was a Tuesday meeting. I do remember the meetings as a young person. I remember the, the public talks and the watchtowers seemed to just go up. As a very young person, they just seemed to go on forever and you didn't want to sit there and you just got so bored and fidgeting. And then the Thursday meetings, theocratic mystical, different people talking. And then studying for something called the ministry that at the time I didn't really understand what that was. Little did I know. <laughs> um, so that was my first early memories of it. Some of the other things that I remember that were, I look back at now and think were problematic. I remember being up in the northeast and going on the ministry sometimes. It's cold up there anyway. I'm sure a lot of people know, a lot of people that live in England know how cold the northeast of England gets. And for those of you that are further afield, the northeast of England very, very cold. And then further north than that, Scotland, where it's even colder. But it was, there are terrible winters up at the northeast, North Sea, especially near from where I'm from, Middlesbrough. And I remember being out a lot of the times on the ministry in the winter. Not when it was raining particularly, because you would just sit in the car 
but when it was cold, like bitterly cold. And I remember sometimes just with socks and shoes on and my feet, looking back now were agony. And I, I'm not just saying that for effect. I mean, looking back now, probably dangerously cold. And there was nothing you could say and there was nothing you could do and they would be so cold that they would go numb and you couldn't feel them. And that that's, that isn't a good place to be as a young person. I don't think that's a good place to be as a parent when your child's telling you that your feet are so cold that you, you know, you're nearly in tears or you are in tears and you just told you have to get on with it. That was never comfortable. But I have two other memories of being on the ministry. I remember being in Stockton on Tees, literally 200 yards from the Kingdom Hall. And I was, it was a Saturday or Sunday morning. I can't remember which it was. It was a Saturday or Sunday morning. We're on a chair. I was with um, a brother and a sister. I remember who they are, but their names are relevant now. I haven't seen them since probably that day. Uh, my memory is that we were stood, they were stood, and I was with them as a young person sat, stood, talking to her on the door, and all of a sudden she collapsed uh, fully onto me, all the way around, and I was probably six or seven, collapsed onto me. I remember her banging her head, because she kind of fell and then twisted round and banged her head on the Anyway, a couple of other guys came, brothers came, carried her into the house, and she had had a brain hemorrhage. There and I'm, I'm not saying I am not saying that anything that they were responsible because that would be just a stupid thing to say because that would be ridiculous. They weren't responsible, but to have seen that as such a young person, and then she died, and I remember the week after or the week after that, I can't remember if it was going to the meeting on the ministry on the Saturday. I can't remember the car, the funeral procession going past us, and the, the hatred that I saw in some of the people's faces that were watching us. And that's all stuck with me. I can see that now. It's just a memory. It's not a particularly good memory. It's a memory about being on the ministry and something bad happened. I remember being on the ministry again. I can't remember where. And a guy had been saying that he'd studied the Bible and read the Bible. And I think one of the couple that I was with kind of said that it was trying to make the point that it was evident that he hadn't read it. He shouted that is rude and he shoved me and again i was probably only seven or eight shoved me whole chestedly out of the way that is rude i have studied the bible and slammed the door so that was a death an assault <laughs> and these you know that's another memory of the ministry that i had but the, the the memories that are often difficult i think for young people is when you're on a ministry and you know you're going down the path of someone that you go to school with and they say, yes, Jehovah will give you strength to deal with that. But I don't know if that's something that happens. Well, well, actually, do you, do you know, I know it isn't. I am not a believer. I know that there are a lot of former Jehovah's Witnesses that I've spoken to online now. And have messaged me and emailed me. Um, that still have a faith in God, just that they don't believe that... Jehovah's Witnesses are the organisation that they want to be associated with in order to express their belief in God properly. I now do not, under, I, I categorically am saying, I do not have a belief in God. I am atheist. Um, in all my time in that religion, that cult, I never saw any evidence of a God. I never saw any evidence of his Holy Spirit. I never saw any evidence of him directing anything or anyone. All I saw was a group of people being governed and bullied by a small group of people in America, too terrified to do anything about, too terrified to live when they're being told what they can do and when and where and how. And again, as we said, what books they can read, what music they can listen to. And you know, we're talking about um, the Watchtower. I, I remember the, the magazines and the publications would often use words like sexual perversion and perv perverts and deviants and all of those sorts of things. And yet, and it is the case for me that they wrap sex up 
in such a way that it creates difficulties for people. When they are prescribing who you can and can't have sex with and when and in what position and who with, it's almost making the act which is actually fun and exciting and enjoyable whilst also at the same time it can be dark and dirty and seedy and still exciting but their interest in the sex lives of everybody over whom they govern for me now looking back and into rather than out of makes them the sexual perverts i had um after my first marriage broke up i had struck up a relationship with a girl that was a jehovah's witness we had both been married and we got ourselves into a situation where we committed uh, fornication and don't forget fornications ranked up there with the likes of murder and theft in the bible something that humans have done since humans were humans for all of that time is a mortal sin if you're not married to the person that you're doing it with and it's just a ludicrous crazy belief the urge is natural the urge to want to do it is natural you're attracted to a pretty girl and you got you get that urge and you might be attracted to a, a girl and you might be attracted to a handsome guy or if you're the same sex homosexuality for me isn't a big deal anymore the bigotry in the organization and the, it's just unfathomable to me but i will get to that because that's on the notes the next thing are so there's just a few memories i had from when i was young on the ministry i never ever liked the ministry i hated it i did it because it was something i had to do and i was told if you're doing it and you don't like it you're still serving you're still serving and you'll get jehovah's blessing oh which never did for obvious reasons I was about to apologise there in case I was upsetting the feelings of some people that have left and still believe, but I'm not going to do that. I don't believe anymore. I do not think any of it's true. I think now, um, I, I, having looked at so many things subsequently um, in great depth, so many of the teachings for me, for me, just don't hold water. I cannot believe, obviously, for obvious reasons in creation. Um, a staunch believer in evolution that we came here one way or another by means of evolution um, I don't believe that God exists I don't believe that anyone called Jesus Christ ever came to earth I don't believe any of it any of it whatsoever I find religion abhorrent now not necessarily the people I don't have that that almost disgusting casuistry oh yeah uh, we hate the sin but we don't hate the sinner well it's not the case of homosexuality is it but we'll get to that but we'll get to that i'm jumping ahead of myself again i went to bethel in america for a while um when the bethel was um in brooklyn i was i visited there i went up to Wallkill, uh, upstate new york and stayed there um, for a period of time as well. So I saw I saw the whole I saw the whole gum up. Um, I stayed with Albert Schroeder um, briefly, who a lot of you will remember who he was. Um, and do you know what? Looking back, I have to be fair. It wasn't an unpleasant experience. It really wasn't. Um, what was going on there? was like it was i had the fits of the giggles <laughs> at one of the meetings there that really really did not go down well but being a bigger guy there's not a lot they're going to do and i'll keep referring to that but having been at school as such a small skinny child and being so severely bullied um my motivation to become a weightlifter was based on the fact that i was so small and bullied and pushed around and told to know my place and all of those things so long so now i enjoy being bigger than most people and uh i find myself much less frequently in a position where people are trying to push me around 
So that's what that is. I hope that doesn't have come across as arrogant. I don't mean it to. I hope that you can understand having been so small and feeling so insignificant when you're in a position to do something about that. Like being a Jehovah's Witness when you are such a small, tiny part in such a massive machine and you're insignificant regardless of what they tell you and you do something about it. That's something you should be proud of and celebrate. I really do believe that. And that's how I feel about that. And also having overcome being so small and skinny and ignored and not seen. My wife says, I don't feel seen. Just joking with me. Yeah. So I visited um, Bethel. I went there with a, went and visited somebody, had a tour with a guy, with an elder from England, who I loved and still do love very dearly, although I haven't seen him for such a long time. But anyway, um, we went into the right, one of the department, one of the offices of one of the guys that was writing, and he asked me a very strange question. I wrote this down, it came to me earlier today, I've wrote it down, and it ties in so nicely with what's been going on with all these sex abuse and child abuse cover-ups and everything. He said to me, um, the question, let me get this right, because I want to get this accurate, accurate as possible. He said, if you were abused physically or sexually by your parents, do you still have to respect them or love and respect them? I think my sense of justice, but I, that was a strange question to ask me because I was young, young enough for him maybe to have thought twice about that question. And I said, well, it would be difficult to love and respect somebody that had abused you, especially if they were under the, the uh, if they had the knowledge that you had been sent as a gift from God, which children are. And he said, listen to what I said. And he went, well, that's not really the case. He said, and this was a guy that wrote for headquarters, um, love and honour your parents, which is the first command with a promise, which is what he said. So just because they've done something doesn't mean that you don't, you can just ignore that command. <laughs> Make of that what you will. I probably haven't put that as across as quite eloquently as I would like to. If I'm, if I'm stumbling over my words a little bit here, if... I'm not finishing points. I, I do need to put this out there. I have, over the last couple of years, been struggling with um, memory problems. And I am being... Um, I'm having investigations to see whether I'm suffering with early onset Alzheimer's, dementia, Alzheimer's. Um, I've had some tests already. I'm waiting to see a more consultant, another consultant to see what the diagnosis is. So if I'm not finishing points, so if I seem a little bit incoherent at times or stumbling over my words, it might be that. I don't know if that is the case, but that's how I'll try to <laughs> quantify it in my mind. If you are still with me, when we used to, when we were younger, my brother and me anyway, we would sometimes be so bored at the meetings and we'd start to mess around and fuck about and we get that look down the aisle for my dad. And as I said, what I'm about to tell you now, um, I have a fabulous relationship with my dad now. He's great. I love my dad. But when he was gripped by this religion, we would get physical punishment. And, you know, it's neither here nor there for me. But the manner in which it was doled out back then was problematic for me. And now looking back, I understand it's abuse. We would be told that we'd be getting a slap or a smack when we got in, we'd go home. My brother and me would then be marched into the living room while he found a slipper or something to hit us with. And we'd be told we had to bend over and touch our toes. And at a time that we would just have to wait on, one of us would get a slapped ass could be once, could be three or four times. And if my dad started on the other one, you had to just stay there knowing that any second now it was gonna be your turn. It's abuse. It is physical abuse. And like I said, he was gripped then. He, it was 
he was brainwashed in the same way that we were, or I was. And I don't hold that against him. I don't like the fact that it happened and I've never done that to my children. Nothing like that. They probably do it to me. <laughs> but that wasn't cool. That's an abuse that it's just not cool. It was never sexual. I have to point that out there. Nothing like that ever happened. It wasn't, but that's an idea. Going to school in the village in which I now live. The first time... Um, it was probably the first time I I had ever noticed a girl. Knowing full well I wasn't allowed to do anything about it, I noticed a girl at school when I was 13. And I remember what she looks like to this day. And I can remember where I saw her and what she looked like. And I smiled at her and she smiled back. And uh, I think everybody remembers the first time that they see someone from the opposite sex, that they are just like, wow. And I remember, even as a 13 or 14, 13, for whatever it was, thinking, oh, oh, anyway. That was a, a big deal for me because I remember thinking I didn't understand those feelings because I was so young. But what I did understand was that nothing could ever be done about that. Because A, she wasn't one of Jehovah's Witnesses, and one, it wouldn't be, wouldn't, would be frowned on, and my dad wouldn't. My mum and dad would never have let me do anything about it and I'd done everything and all of those pressures of God wouldn't like it and gee and all of the elders and, the, and all. There is more to that story. Um, uh, we had the Thursday meeting and in the village that we lived in there was a youth club. It was called a youth club and for those that are not sure what that is in other countries um, in England, you'll know what it is, but if you're from another country, youth club is, is like a little place, like a little house or a, something in the local the local area that you live in, and it's set up for kids to go to, young people, and you can play ping pong or pool, or you can listen to music or just hang out. Just a cool place for when you're younger. And ours was on a Thursday. And I remember once or twice that, for whatever reason, we didn't go to the Thursday meeting, which was a really big deal. And I used to go and hang out around the village. And a couple of times I went to the youth club and that girl that I remember seeing at school was there a couple of times, which didn't help because she was, you know, she, she was so, I thought to myself, oh, she's so beautiful, oh my God. But I can't do anything about it. And I knew I wouldn't be there the next day or the next time it was on and I'd have to see her at school and all of those things. Missed out on the clubs, the football clubs. I used to play football when I was young, that stopped. Um, rugby, all of those things, never got a chance to take part in those things. And so that's something else that you miss out. That, that socialising with normal people that have normal beliefs and will watch television and films and listen to all sorts of music. And it just kind of really expands and makes you a more rounded human being. As I'm sure most of you are aware. Um, I met a girl not long after my first marriage broke up. Let's just cut this, get, get to the meat of this really quick. We fucked about, didn't have sex, but we did everything, everything bar that. Both of us had been married before, had a pang of conscience. Uh, she went to her elders, I went to mine, and this is one of the early on signs again where I had to sit in front of you a judicial committee. I spoke to an elder. He said, look, okay, I'll speak to the elders. They assigned a judicial committee. I went to the meeting, expecting just to be able to say, look, we engaged in what was, I'm sure any of you that have been through it, mutual masturbation and oral sex. But they wanted the detail. They wanted the gory, graphic details. And I was so uncomfortable doing that, even as someone that had been married and was an adult at this point and that was really problematic for me in fact one of the elders was digging in so deep at that point one of the elders had to cut across him and say well, well, well i think we've got enough information there that was a biggie that was a biggie but it's not cool because you don't need that much detail and i was at the point where i was probably not going to give him any more anyway we've done that one i've done that one from when I was about 
12, um, one of my closest friends, I'm not going to say his name, it's not fair, if he sees this he'll know who he is, and we went through so much together, we moved to another country together, went to each other's wedding, <laughs> we went through so much together, so much, did so many things, went so many places, shared so just as close as you can be to another guy without him being your brother. I saw him only four years ago, maybe, and I introduced him to the girl I was seeing. I wasn't a Jehovah's Witness at this point. He didn't care. He, he We embraced. Really looking forward to spending some time with him again. And then he cut me dead. And we've been getting on really well and looking forward to spending some time together. And he had become an elder and he cut me dead. I just messaged him and tried to be in touch. And the guy that I knew him to be would have either come around and said to me, look, I'm going to be appointed as an elder or I've been appointed. We can't have anything to do with each other anymore, which is fine. Or even a message, but nothing, nothing. I was cut dead. And... Do you know what? That's still a little bit of, I don't like it. It doesn't, does it hurt? I don't know if it hurts, but I guess I'm just a little bit disappointed because we were close friends. We were best friends for such a long time. And for him to just be able to do that is quite telling to me. Well, I think he could have just let me know with a message or a text. At least that offers you what I think they call it closure, whatever. Having left, that organisation. I took myself off to university as a mature student. I, live, I was living by myself at this point and single. And I lived in Leicestershire in a little place called Aylston, not far from Leicester Tigers. And I remember seeing an advert in the local paper asking for rugby players to go to the training on the Thursday. I uh, went to that training this is relevant went to that training and there was a golf gti cabriolet parked up mark one i was walking across the rugby pitch and i saw somebody bending over in there and i said excuse me and this thing <laughs> stood up six foot five 25 stone big beard and i remember thinking oh my god i have made a terrible mistake Anyway, went in, got on. I'm going to cut this story a little bit shorter as well. That guy's name was Ross. And Ross and me hit it off immediately. And we became really, really close friends really quickly. Like unusually quickly. But I didn't care because I enjoyed his company. He was hilarious. We were just good for each other. Looking back, we were both damaged for various reasons, and we've been good for each other ever since, and he is still a major part of my life. I found Ross on Facebook not long after, and was confused as to why he was at a wedding and he was there with another man, and I'm like, oh my God, oh my God, he's, he's gay. And I'd been spending time with him, and nothing bad had happened, I hadn't turned gay, I hadn't woken up with leprosy, he hadn't tried to force his cock into me or anything like that nothing weird had happened I just found someone that was actually a really decent human I remember the brainwashing that went on saying that homosexuality is disgusting and they'll try to do this and that and nothing could be further from the truth and he is he is my closest friend apart from my wife he's my best friend and his husband Stuart is a major fixture in our lives as well and uh, I would lay down in traffic for him and if he sees this, this will make him a bit emotional. <laughs> but he's my best mate. And he was the best man at my wedding. And he is the best man I have ever known that has come into my life. Really is. He's amazing. And so that bigotry that I was subjected to was kind of just melted away without really any effort. Thanks to him. And I've because of him seen so much and experienced so much and learned so much and 
you know, how he is the, the best and bravest and kindest human that has come into my life as an adult that I've ever known. Um, I think my son's going to come through this door in a minute. I'm going to have to tell him to jog on until I finish this. Um, I was going to talk about some of the things that I have huge problems with in the Bible now. You know, the fact that women are treated as chattel on property. Um, how the Bible is almost like an instruction manual on slavery. How the, the, the genocide that's instructed there, the child sacrifice, which is almost mandated. But I think to start to go into those things leads me down a path I'm not really bothered about. I think once you've left, you can start to see massive holes in, in the whole thing. I'm aware this is 35 minutes, which is longer than either one. I want to finish up. I want to finish up. And I hope this makes you all, if you're still here now, this for me is the best bit. I'm hoping to make you feel all warm and fuzzy inside. The girl that I saw when I was at school, used to see, when I was 17, I still had a huge crush on her and went round her house, knocked on her dad's door and she answered the door. And I, knowing what I was doing, was probably going to get me in a ton of shit. I knocked on that door, she answered, and I said, would you like to come out with me? And she said no. And she said no, because I know you're Jehovah's Witness and I don't want anything to do with that religion. I walked away from that door thinking, <laughs> Jehovah's just saved me from something that could have been really bad happening. That's what I thought. Even I'd been round and asked her. Fast forward to 2019. Um, I was single. I was at work. Uh, on a night shift, I worked for O2. And I was on Facebook. I'm not on Facebook anymore. I was on Facebook, looking through, scrolling. The sharper among you will have already figured where I'm going with this. <laughs> Um, I saw uh, that girl that I was at school with all them years ago and I thought oh I'm, I'm going to have to message so I sent her a message hi you look remarkably like a girl I went to school with is your name, I didn't, I didn't actually say is your name Louise, and that was her name Louise. Is your name Louise? I didn't, I put, you look remarkably like the Louise that I went to school with, because she had a different name. And she shot back, oh well, because I am. I am that same girl. Long story short, we chatted. <laughs> we arranged to meet in New York on Trent. We met up. We didn't have long because she had to go back to work, but we met up. And we discussed that whole thing. And I had kids at this point and Louise had a son at this point and we were both single. And the date went great. We arranged another one and then another one and then another one. <laughs> and two years ago, um, two years ago, oh no, three years ago, three years ago, I walked her back round to her dad's house who still lived there, to where I had asked her out the first time um, as a Jehovah's Witness. I walked her back this time as a free man. And when we got there, just as we were at the front door, I um, said, listen, I need to ask you something. Back to where she was when she turned me down the first time. And I took a ring out, got down on one knee and proposed to her in that exact same spot. Why well, she turned me down the first time? And she said yes. And two years ago, a year after that, we got married. And so things, I don't believe in fate or destiny, but things have a way of working out. 
eventually I really believe it. And so the girl that I saw, the first girl at school that I really had a crush on, after all of those years, I actually ended up with again and getting married. And she is my best friend, the best thing that ever happened to me. She is the first girl that I, girlfriend or girl that I had, or a woman that I've been with. Which, in which the relationship wasn't pressured by that religion, by that cult, without any interference, without anybody looking in and telling us how we can behave and what we should do and what we shouldn't do and what and all of that. And it is a fabulous marriage. We have a fabulous relationship. We spend all our time together. We got together just around about lockdown and we spent 24 hours a day for that whole period of time together. And we just got stronger and stronger. We've been together for five years now. And she's the love of my life. And whilst I like to be a little bit romantic and think, well, it would have been nice if we could have been together since we were, we were younger. I know it's ridiculous because it didn't happen. It's nice to think. And so why I left that till the end is because it doesn't matter how long you've been in that cult, whether you're trying to leave now or whether you've left recently or you're about to leave, you can still live your life. You can still enjoy whatever time you have. I'm 50, I might only have 10 years, 20, whatever. Doesn't matter, you can still go and enjoy what you have left of your life. I know my dad does now, and he's got tattoos now as well, and Odin tattoos, and loves all the Norse mythology and all of those things as I do. But don't think if you leave, you'll have nothing, because you will, you will have more than you ever thought in life experience, in fun, real friends. You can drop the bigotry. You can live a life how it's meant to be lived, free and in a way that allows you to express yourself properly. So anyway, again, this is 42 minutes now. I'm so sorry. If there's, there's plenty more, let me tell you. If you would like any more, just comment down below. If not, it doesn't matter. But for those that are still with it, thank you for listening. Um, maybe I should do the next one in front of like a little podium with a shirt and tie on. <laughs> Wouldn't that be hilarious? But anyway, keep doing what you're doing. Um, enjoy your life. Stay hard. See you all soon. Bye-bye.